he studies developmental biology and, and has made many contributions to the field in terms of fundamental understandings of the morphogenesis of vascular tissue, of neural tissue, um, of primordial germ cell migration. And what's really notable um, about Rusty is in addition to these contributions, he's also been a leader in developing and applying many new tools spanning many different disciplines. So that includes, for example, work he did with Scott Frazier and others to develop multispectral imaging technology that's actually used in Zeiss microscopes now, um, as well as developing technologies for visualizing gene expression, um, work related to hybridization chain reaction, the very sensitive in situ hybridization method that allows you to, to multiplex the detection of many genes at once, um, as well as tools for functionally uh, modulating gene activity and, and looking at its effects on the embryonic development. Um, and so with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Rusty. Thank you. I like the hoot in the back. That was awesome. Some energy for dev bio. So I, I really appreciate coming back here to Columbia. It's, it's changed. There's all new buildings between physician surgeons in here now that I didn't know about. And I had a blast when I was here as a grad student. I felt really lucky. I was in the Hammer building and I felt like, boy, there was a lot going on there in various labs. So it was thoroughly enjoyable experience here for me. I learned a lot. I was humbled a lot too. I think that's part of grad school. You've got a feedback there. Yeah. Okay. So my labs changed over the last couple of years. We were, I've always been interested in technology and developing new technologies like multispectral imaging. Um, but COVID gave us a chance. Can we stop the feedback? It's... No, but it's... I hear me here. Um, so during COVID, I mean, that delayed my coming here even. Um, my labs changed a bit. We were pretty into developmental biology and I've gotten kind of purged some of the projects that we were working on and I've started all new projects. And the common thread on, on some of it is how the environment or environmental stressors um, affect development. And so today I'm going to show you some of the older stuff that we've been doing. And then I'm going to show you some projects that are just starting. And there's limited data, but I'm already finding collaborators here on some of these projects. So I'll kind of tell you where we're going more than where we've been on some of them. So this is um, a developing quail embryo. It's a model system that we work with quite a bit. And this is an MRI of that, that just kind of allows you to see what's going on inside the egg. Um, and we did a whole bunch of these years back with an 11.7 Tesla MRI. And then we used high school students to help us do the annotations on all these. We gave them a salary or I guess a, a wage, um, peanut M&Ms and, and their own music. Uh, and room to play in. And, and it really turned out well. This was a summer of annotations for all of them. And it kind of gave us a, a static hold on using kind of multimodal approaches to imaging development. And the model system that my lab works with quite a bit are Caternic Japonica, Japanese quail. And the reason we do it is they're basically um, a bird or a mouse with wings. And they develop pretty quickly. They're, they're sexually mature in six to eight weeks. They hatch in 16 to 17 days. We've, um, what's down here is that we've sequenced the genome. We've developed molecular biology tools for them so we can make transgenics now. Um, we can do knockouts and a variety of other things. So it's a really nice model system for a lot of what we're wanting to do. And the main part for developmental purpose is that the developing embryo was uncoupled from the mom. So we could put an embryo under a microscope stage for 
two to five days and keep it alive and not have to do these heroic and, and rather macabre things to the mom to keep her asleep and stable while we pull out the embryo. So that was the, the main driver on all this. And what I like also about the quail is it's not only, um, I don't have a pointer, I guess, but it's not only a farm animal because it's used in the poultry industry, so you'll see it, but the, here's the transgenic angle where we've got it in the lab. A lot of people hunt them. They're, they're a wild animal also, so we can analyze them in the wild. They've got diminishing geographies and habitat that's affecting their survival. Um, they're a food source for many. And there are some of the subspecies like the one from New Zealand um, are extinct due to human pressures on them. So from that point of view, it's something that we can work with in the lab and really has a native environmental angle, which has been helpful in certain ways. So when we're making transgenics, or, or this is the way we've done it for years, we take um, human immunodeficiency virus, we pull out all the bad stuff that causes disease, we stick in promoters uh, that are ubiquitous or tissue specific driving our favorite fluorescent proteins. Uh, we inject them into about a three to four millimeter hole in a freshly laid egg into the blastoderm, hopefully hitting the germ cells. And just like mouse genetics or, or the other systems, we get a chimera out of it and we breed that for germline transmission. And then we've worked out ways to image these guys while keeping them alive either, either in ex ovo cultures or in ovo. More recently, we've been pushing some of this to different viruses like adenovirus, which are giving us a higher titer, and I'll address that down the road here. And here's our existing ones. We've made several that we no longer carry just due to space and money considerations. But the Thai one is an endothelial specific driving histone 2B yellow fluorescent protein. So it, the histone 2B takes it into the nucleus, it associates with DNA. We can follow cell divisions, things like that. We've got others that are H2B cherry and ubiquitously expressed or ubiquitously expressed membrane GFP, H2B cerulean, or dendro 2, a photoconvertible fluorescent protein. And years back, um, as mentioned already, when I was with Scott Frazier, we developed a lot of imaging techniques and, and some math with it to do um, multispectral analysis using tools that we got from a, the Earth Remote Sensing Group at Jet Propulsion Lab. And it was an, actually a really fun project. And it got us going because at the time, and this is dating, um, we were just doing one or two colors at a time. And that was a real drawback to imaging. So back at the end of the 1990s or so, we started getting this ability to do many, many colors at once, which allowed you to see different tissues interacting with one another, different cells interacting, just like you would kind of with a map of the United States having four different colors. And this is just a representative image of some of the transgenics. Nowadays, we we like to kind of interbreed them because we get powerful answers out of this when we do this. So this is a um, ubiquitously expressed histone 2B cherry. And this is the ubiquitously expressed membrane EGFP. And then when we put them together, we'll do imaging where we collect this over time, longitudinally across time and in Z. So we'll collect different approaches on that. And this is all older data. And this is a movie, and I'll orient you ahead of time. Um, well, there's an orientation here, it's blocked, but this is a ventral aspect, kind of looking at it like this. The head would be over here. This is the anterior intestinal portal, um, the central parts of neural tube. You'll see somites form along here, and this will be the heart forming here. And this is this movie is pretty old at this point. It's a double transgenic you'll see yellow popping up as cells differentiate to become endothelial cells. And then all the cells are labeled with H2B cerulean. And, and at the time, this was pretty cool because we were collecting in six different sections here in X, Y, Z over time and lambda, spectral color. And then we had to stitch everything together. And so nowadays this is much easier, but at the time we were pretty happy with ourselves on this. And it's, you must be on 
uh, internet here. So this should be smoother and many more slides in here. But what you're seeing is the cells slowly come up. Here's the heart. Normally you would follow this pretty smoothly. Uh, the endocardium forming inside, the heart starting to loop to the side, and then beating here at the very end, which makes it just blurry because we're not collecting fast enough. But this is collecting down about 150 microns. Um, we're doing it quickly, so our Z-sections were really thick, six micron Z-sections. And trust me, if this was playing a little bit better, it's, it's a real continuous flow here. We're just a little bumpy with this one. And it was important at the time, instead of just having stuff for a museum, that we came up with ways to quantitate our data. And so we spent a lot of time doing quantitative analysis. Again, this should be smoother if it was playing correctly. But you're seeing that uh, the, the heads here are where the cells are, and the little dragon tails behind represent where they've been for the past two hours. And we can separate all the Z sections and analyze them independently or follow them in time. And this has been helpful for us to understand what is normal development and what is abnormal development by doing the comparisons between the two. And I'll just show a couple more older slides here. And uh, this is the H2B cerulean line where we can photo convert from a green dendro 2 to a red dendro 2. So it's useful for shorter term experiments because in a sense that red's kind of like a dye that as the cells go over time, that dye is going to get photo bleached a little bit more, one of the drawbacks of using vital dyes. And also as the cells divide, it gets diluted out. Um, but the green is still always being made there. And there's a variety of ways, either from prime photo conversion or just using a UV excitation, but you get kind of out of plane focus uh, um, excitation on that to image across here. And again, we always thought this would be great for people interested in the mechanics of development. So you can see here, we've put all this stuff together, the H2B Cerulean's here, and you can see where we've scored across with lasers, different directions to watch heart development. And we've done this through the heart, through development, and kind of an overriding angle that we get out of this is this was just going all the way through with the excitation light that we could. And so we're imaging different layers. And the different layers, it's like um, plate tectonics, how layers slide past one another in the Earth's um, uh, continental shelves. This is tissue tectonics, coined by a friend of mine at, at Cambridge. And it allows us to do pretty much anything we want. We can draw our forms in this direction. We can put in squares, circles. We can label individual cells if we want using these technologies. And so in terms of that and working with this line and uh, uh, some of the membrane GFPs, we, we always wanna find friends that are interested in the mechanics of development for these kind of tools. I'm just funny saying it to this audience. And then one of the drawbacks of a lot of this, the movies you've seen so far, they're ex ovo cultures. And that's fine, but the development gets a little wonky about two and a half days into development as the heart starts looping and the head's um, turning over and we're getting more depth in 3D. The embryo doesn't develop what like we would normally see it in ovo. So we've spent a lot of time trying to come up with new techniques on how we can basically get out of the fragility of the, the quail egg because we've got a really expensive microscope and we don't want to break and have it fall down in our scope. And it's sometimes tough to do the manipulations inside an egg, but we've we've done some microfabrications and we've also just played on a simple level with six well plates and we can kind of cut them out using um, quick scissors and pour them in and we can follow development now for you know seven or eight days with some of these systems. The catch with this is the, the oxygen's not diffusing through the PDMS on the sides as well. And we have to kind of artificially bump up the environment with oxygen because it's just not permeable enough. And again, that's something that we didn't figure out, but I'm sure there's an answer out there somewhere. Okay, 
So this is what we're really doing nowadays or, or more currently. And this is our first kind of go in on, we're, we're trying to develop new sensors to study heart development. And congenital heart defects are really complicated. Some are genetic, some are induced by the environment. They're some of the commonest of all um, birth defects known. And what's really Im important about some of the environmental things and the developmental origins of health and disease is that as the embryo is developing across time, different organs and tissues have critical moments, critical periods of development, where if there is an insult during that period, it can really um, artificially hurt craniofacial development or heart development if it's at a critical time or kidney development. And then the, the brain's the most sensitive of all because that takes place and continues to develop till you're 25 ish or so. so Development really, you can take a long view of all this and, and how to study insults. And this is really where a lot of my research is going nowadays is how does environment play a role in here? And instead of being genetic regulations, more epigenetic regulation to tie that in. Um, one of the ones that we are working on right now with some collaborators at Case Western Reserve University is um, they've developed a really nice model system for fetal alcohol syndrome using quail as a model system. And basically we're, we're adding alcohol during their development and they undergo craniofacial defects and they've also been observed various structural defects in the heart that are really similar to some of the structural defects you would see in humans. And this is kind of some of the proof of concept data from my collaborators that they've done over time. And we're really interested in following this up. And in their original studies, they noticed that they've got a whole bunch of different defects in there um, in, in the exposed alcohol versus the wild types. Blood flow was affected. Um, the, the structure of the heart and the divisions between the various um, heart chambers is affected, but what they didn't have the tools to do is start to study activity. So we recently got funding from the NIH to do these studies, and the ongoing work now is that we're trying to develop new calcium sensors and voltage sensors so we can pan, excite both of them at the same time in a living embryo and see how those are changed in the, the model system across time. And that's stuff that we're just now starting. And our, our initial proof of concepts are just working with GCAMP 6, which we did, uh, this was an undergrad research project over the summer. And they just kind of figured out using a really simple fluorescence dissecting scope, how to inject in some of the constructs that we're trying to make and analyze them on a simple fluorescence dissecting scope. The way we're gonna need to do this in, in, um, in this grant though, is we're trying to find voltage sensors, which need to be really, really sensitive and probably are gonna be based on green fluorescent protein and how we match those with calcium sensors that are a little less sensitive, um, but probably will not be green. There's a lot of green ones, they work really well like this, but um, the red ones that exist don't get excited too much with a two photon microscope. Uh, we need to go really quick because we've got a beating heart. So we're starting to play with other ones that we can excite with a two photon using the same 900 or 880 to 900 nanometer voltage for the excitation across and pan excite the two of them and separate them with um, fluorescence lifetime imaging or spectral characteristics. And it's we, we really don't have it figured out yet, but that's where we're going with it. <clears throat> This is again, some older data. And to make a transgenic line, this is showing primordial germ cells here. And the dark spots are showing that, well, here at four hours, the PGCs are thought to be predetermined, but that's still not totally understood if they're not more induced and specified like they are in mammals. Um, and they undergo this delamination where they drop down to the lower level of the embryo, the hypoblast, and they kind of go for a free ride. 
um, with a whole bunch of yolk in their, in their cytosol. And they get to another extra embryonic region of the embryo called the germinal crescent up at the top. And when they're up there, they are unique. Most, most germ cells in all the animals I know have this period where they go extra embryonic and then have to kind of come back in to find the gonadal enlage. What's unique about birds is they enter, undergo an intravasation where they enter into circulation. They circulate for about a day and then they follow chemokine signals to the gonadal enlage where they extravate kind of like a tumor cell and they lodge in there and then they start to develop. And for us to make the transgenics, we're always trying to hit these cells. And to be honest, our efficiency is not great. We get about one in 20 germline transmission of one in 25 to one in 100. And we'd like to improve that for a variety of reasons. And these other slides are just showing kind of our due diligence. This isn't showing up well, but this is the transgenic. And you can see that some of the cells look a little brighter than the others. And it's because the histone 2B localizes into the nucleus of these cells and PGCs divide very, very slowly compared to all the other cells. So they're super bright. So it's really easy to pick them out. And this is just using antibodies and, and HCR fish to show that if we put primordial germ cell specific um, probes on them, that these bright ones are indeed germ cells. So we can follow them really easily. And this is a movie and here, if this is, I hope you guys can see this, I can't from this angle, but all these really bright things, they're up in the germinal crescent and they're moving. And they're about to undergo um, intravasation. And they're just kind of moving up and sideways and we're tracking them and following how they divide. And they're not really dividing, they divide slower than every 30 hours. And most of the cells in the developing embryo are about every six to eight hours. And then at the end of that, we we take a real high resolution image of it. We know where the various PGCs have been because we can track them. We come in with antibodies or um, normally because we want to be gentle with them at this point and we can stain them. And then we can carry out single cell RNA-seq on those. So we know the cells for the most part, depending on how tiny we do our dissections and because we break these into quadrants, it's allowed us to kind of understand what are the molecules that are, you know, are, are the PGCs developing over time? And they really are. So again, we see a big change in them over time. And this is an important aspect for us to follow. So we get better at making the transgenics. This is that and a um, whole bunch of different molecules in here. This is actually stage three. We've done it at stage one, three, 12, um, 18 when they're in the gonadal enlage. And some of these genes like Dazzle, DN, D1, DDX4, they're RNA binding proteins basically, but they're extremely, they're only found in the germ cells. Some of these other ones are more commonly found in pluripotent cells also. And so those have given us a tool to kind of target, because we've got where, like I said, we've got some conservation biology goals and we've got some, um, we'd like to make our transgenics a little bit better. Um, so this is where we're at today. This is showing if we're trying to infect in with the old method, um, and these are two gonads in a transgenic line, and these ones over here are showing how we've infected them with different fluorescent markers, um, but that efficiency is not as high as we wish. So this is where our, uh, we've got another shift going on. And I, I kind of feel the threat. I, my youngest is 19 and he's kind of freaked out about climate change. And sometimes he gets a little darker than I want him to about, you know, things are doomed, you know, why bother? And I try and convince him in my gray haired way to vote and do things like that, make a difference. But it, it was bugging me too, because I brought the kid into the world and you know, I, I gotta do my part to hopefully leave him a good planet. And so birds are again, my focus on that, there's about 10,800 different birds in the world. And birds are actually essential. I probably you guys don't think of birds as much as I do, but they're an integral part of the food chain, food webs, 
they control pests, they pollinate, they disperse plant seeds. And I view them also as a harbinger for doom and destruction. Um, 50, 60 years ago, there was this nasty chemical called DDT and animals were suffering from DDT. And the scientists at the time didn't think, they thought the animals, what was happening to them wouldn't happen to humans. And actually DDT and many of these other synthetic chemicals at the time do have effects on humans. So I, I tend to take this kind of broad view of when I see things going wrong in the environment, um, it's not terrible to pay attention to it. And a few years ago, there was a nice science paper that gave some terrible data here saying that basically since 1970, we were lost at least in the United States and Canada alone, 25% um, of the bird populations. And that's kind of a conservative number. And that's due to habitat change, climate change, um, building, putting buildings and flight paths and things like that. But the long and the short of it are chemicals and pollutants is as you start to see them decline, I view them as a harbinger of <laughs> good and bad things for us. So that's one of the angles that we're approaching. How do we go about conserving these species? And how do we, does a technophile like me, try not to play God um, with them, but try and you know, make amends or, or help fix what, um, what humans are doing to them? So we've taken two approaches to this. We're working with CRISPR-Cas9, which I'm sure everybody knows a lot about, to target certain genes of interest. And those, those PGC specifics are coming back in. And we're also working with Cas13D um, to target the RNAs on this. And there's two different reasons on this. So the goal here for the with one of those genes, it's Dazzle and DDX. Um, DND1 and DDX4, just let's just say RNA binding proteins, um, is to target them, do a non-homologous inactivation, which we've done. But if we kill the germ cells, we're not going to get germline transmission. So we need to hit one allele and not the other. There's a little trick in that. And so we've also got a, a plan B where we're going to do a knock-in, and this is what we're doing now to put in a CRISPR-Cas9 so you know, if we want, we can kill the cells and not always need a double hit. And here's some of the preliminary just analysis data where we're getting the knockouts, we're targeting the locus, our guide RNAs are working. And our big goal here is if we do this in an early blastoderm, in a dazzle plus plus or a heterogeneous animal, we've got germ cells in the gonadal enlage. But when we start to knock them out, we notice that they're missing um, that. So these, in a sense, would be sterile. And we're, we're now breeding for this. And, and it's nothing we created, sterile quail. Why would we want that? But you know, back in the 1980s and 90s, there was two scientists, Palminer and Brinster, that were doing this in mouse genetics to make transgenic mice. And you don't have the selective pressure of these germ cells having to compete with the host germ cells. And I'll explain that a little bit better in the next couple slides. So with our, let me go back one. So where we're at right now is that, yes, it, when we tag, target this and knock out both alleles, we're killing the germ cells along the way. And we're not sure yet, and we're analyzing where we start to do this, but we're breeding this. And this is nice. This was using lentiviruses. So we've left um, uh, uh, an integrated Cas9 in there. And it kind of worries me that I don't really want this nuclease running amok in there. So we've been playing with different approaches also. And on this approach, we're now using adenoviruses. And the adenoviruses don't integrate in the genome. And we can get them about 100 um, times more concentrated. And we're using them for Cas9 studies, and it's giving us a higher efficiency of hitting the germ cells. So maybe that alone will bump up our transmission efficiencies. And we're not leaving them there because they don't integrate in the genome. Soon after cell division, or if this starts to get inactivated, the, the Cas9 source is going away. But we're also starting to work with Cas13D because we'd like to target the RNAs because 
Um, we're working with the San Diego Zoo, the Institute of Conservation Research, as this being a model system for how we could target it and save animals. But you don't want to conserve an endangered species by sticking a lentivirus inside its genome and leaving this genomic footprint behind. Nor do we want to knock out genes in there um, because, again, they're, they're animals that we want to kind of tread lightly, affect them, save them, but not hurt them. So we're getting a co-expression of this Cas13D. Right now, we're targeting cherry fluorescent protein as our proof of concept before we go after the PGCs. And we've seen that we can knock down cherry fluorescent protein, and we've got transgenics. So we can do it in tissue culture, and we can do it in vivo transiently. Nothing, you know, just electroporations or infections. But the real goal is that we're going to come in here to the blastoderm and inject these in. And here we'll get, if they're dazzle positive, we'll have PGCs. And if they're dazzle negative, we won't. And this is where the experiment gets a little trickier in that once we've done that, we would like to be able to inject in germ cells. But as I already said, we've done this a bunch. We get a very low degree of chimerism. We get, you know, two to five percent of the donor germ cells in a host when they're full of germ cells. And the hope is if we follow Palmerster and Brinster's mouse approaches, that if we get rid of the germ cells, and then right during circulation, just a little after day two, we inject in some of these transplant germ cells. They won't have any competition and they'll fully reconstitute the gonadal enlage. And this is what we're doing right now. And um, th the fun part of this is what we can do is I gave all those stories in terms of primordial germ cells, isolating them out from the embryo. Um, the San Diego Zoo has this beautiful place called the Frozen Zoo, and they've got all the animals they can ever get their hands on and their gonadal tissue, and they've got it frozen down in liquid nitrogen tanks. But they're a zoo and they're a conservation research, and they don't really want to make the evening news making chimeras or something like that. So what we're doing is we're taking um, germ cells from adults when we can, and we're able to now freeze these down and we're taking them not just from my Japanese quail, but a bunch of other caternics, and which are, some of them are endangered in Asia and Africa. And we're starting to do those studies to see if we can kind of thaw some of these frozen tissues and reconstitute the birds. And so the goal here, or the dream is that we can go into the animals, endangered animals, use a, a model system to kind of work out the technical kinks, but then apply this to other endangered birds like a California condor. They're, they're doing better now on their own. But th the thought would be that we're not leaving a genetic footprint behind and we're able to put these in and using that same technology will probably improve how we make transgenics. And so that's the ongoing dream here for that. Now, just to confuse, how am, am I okay time-wise or? Yeah. Just to confuse everybody um, a little bit more because I'm already a little scattered on things. Um, when I was younger, I, I grew up, I mean, younger person, I, I love this guy named Jacques Cousteau. I, you guys might not, this, this side probably knows who Jacques Cousteau was, but it was this, this you know, French, entrepreneur, adventure guy who explored the oceans and he had movies or TV shows that came on and he would dive down into the Spanish galleon and he invented scuba and things like that. And it was really cool and I loved him. And then I wanted to be a marine biologist and somehow I, I got sidetracked as an undergrad and got into that cloning stuff. Um, but now that my hair is grayer, I've kind of gone back and one of my buddies at USC um, was having starting to get into algae. And algae are really interesting in a way. They're, they're grown for biofuels. So the um, NSF and Department of Defense and DOE really like kelp as biofuels. Um, throughout the world, people eat kelp all the time. So it's a good food source. I stick kelp nowadays in my smoothies. I've kind of had to learn to 
boil it a little because sometimes my smoothies were crunchy and I realized that there were snails on the kelp that I had collected and that wasn't, that's probably more nutrients than I needed. So I'm now getting those off them. Um, but it's, it's tasty stuff. But they're also, um, they protect the coastlines, things like that, um, but they're endangered. Climate change, and I'm in California, the, the rising temperatures are affecting how kelp grow and how they populate. So my buddy Sergey um, has gone across up and down six different regions of California and collected uh, kelp samples. And in particular, we're collecting um, young zygotes and gametophytes. And if I can keep it simple, it's just sperm and eggs basically, but they're these little microstages um, are pretty cool. And they've done a bunch of genomic analysis on them. And up and down the coast, he's got 600 different samples um, that are genetically unique. And we wanted to see how do those samples, you know, survive thermal stress. And he's not a phenotyper, and I'm kind of a phenotyper with all this imaging stuff I do. So he wanted to figure out a way to have these in these containers and use light sheet microscopy to image all of them and collect it and find, you know, do it for all 600 samples. Some of you guys I'm sure here do light sheet. There's probably a problem you can tell with that, that if you do light sheet on all these samples across time, that the poor grad student that's done this or the, the 20 grad students that are doing that will barely get through the data set in the four or five years that are here. So what we had to do is come up with a, a better way of doing that. And so here's our SNPs and our 600 samples. And what we did is we figured out that we could grow these gametophytes that look like this one up here. They're, they, when they're grown in the lab and we let them get a little bit bigger, they look like sea urchins basically, but they're normally just little fronds and you'll see better on a slide um, in a sec. And we figured out how to grow them in 96 well plates. So there's our high throughput. And then at Children's Hospital LA, they don't love me doing this with algae, but you know we've got this 3D fluorescence tomography device called an IVIS. And it's a way to um, track cancer in living mice across time. So you can follow metastasis and things like that um, for bioluminescence or fluorescence. So trying to screen a sample right there takes about five minutes inside here. And the, the goal would be that we would then find samples that across a few months start to their total fluorescence and we're looking at chlorophyll amounts uh, go down or up or change somehow with thermal temperature. And then when we had come in with the, the higher resolution imaging or single cell RNA seq to see you know more high resolution phenotyping once we've screened. And so that's what we're doing right now. So here's a, a kind of a blow up of a single gametophyte. And here's gametophytes in every single well. A few of the wells have chlorophyll standards in them that we created. And they're growing. And we have grow these for about um, four weeks under thermal stress. And thermal normal is 13 degrees Celsius. And then we've got three degrees up. Our initial experiments were 13 and 24. And when we saw phenotypes, we started filling in every three degrees Celsius. And you can see these guys are filling out inside the chloroplasts or chlorophyll. And so we're just doing a really quick screen longitudinally across time to find the ones that have a change or lose fluorescence altogether. And then doing a bunch of analysis on this more, what was kind of horrifying is we've got about, and we're about 300 samples in, and we've got eight that look interesting and are affected by that. So we've screened them. And then we take them from, you can see just really simple with a 5X objective above, this one's grown normally and this one's under thermal stress. So what do you see? It's just less fluorescent, okay? And it's pretty obviously less fluorescent. Trust me, these were collected in the same way, same exposure, everything. And then when we zoom in with a 40X objective with two photon or confocal to try and see really what's going on, Here's the normal one, and here's one that's under thermal stress. And what you're seeing here is that the chloroplasts are fainter. 
and they've translocated from being on the inner periphery of these macrocystis to kind of collapsing into the center. Maybe the actin bridge that tethers them out there is affected. Some of the cells don't have chloroplasts at all. Um, they're bunched together and they're smaller because we've done you know, just cell segmentation. This is cell segmentation, but on chloroplasts inside the individual cells just to show we could do it. So, and this allows us again to quantitate our data. And then when we get over here, it's just a bad scene. And so we've repeated this over and over and we now kind of have a better understanding. We've done this with ones grown at 13, um, this same person grown at, or same algae grown at 13. And then we've taken some that seem like they were resistant, didn't change their total fluorescent intensity across time. They seem to kind of maintain here. Um, and then we're, so we do that for four weeks, take some samples out. We're kind of doing a micro dissection to tether them out because those guys are big. Um, and then we are kind of moving down this, the way to start to figure out what are the phenotypes that are changing and can we, will the single cell RNA-seq start to guide us more on this. And, and algae, it's just not well known. The genome's kind of been done, but nobody's done a single cell on it. They don't really know if this cell's identical to this cell in terms of its RNA expression pattern. So it's kind of like an open wild, wild west on that. Um, the goal of this down the road is, oh, this is us doing, okay, and this is just, we're hoping to analyze these guys in living uh, using hyperspectral analysis down the road. Um, it's tricky because the chloroplasts respond to the light, so it affects them also. So we've gotta be really light with the light so we don't give them a sunburn. And we're collecting the spectral identities and the hyperspectral identities on them. You probably can't see in here, but when we use vital dyes and stain them, not only are we now seeing the chloroplast and changes, but we see changes in the microbiome also. The, those are these little lines here, just bacteria on them. And so on a really gross observational level, the microbiomes are changing also, which isn't too surprising. So these are just cool pictures that we took and I kind of liked, we call this kind of hopscotch. That's old, it's a different one. And here you can better see some of the, the microbiomes on there as we just overlay. That's just, those are fun pictures. We have a image competition in the lab each month. And this is my buddy, Sergey. And down in an old warehouse down at the docks, he's kind of got the next step. So once we start identifying these, we'll start growing them in these um, 55 gallon drums. And then out in part of uh, USC, the Alta C in Wrigley, there's um, approaches to work with aquaculture farms down the road to start growing these up. Once we're sure everybody's safe and we're not going to unleash anything and we have all the proper permits. So we're really going slowly because we don't want to make the front page of the New York Times by doing something bad. Um, but that, that's kind of, so it's, this has been a fun project also because I'm back in the water. I get to go diving more and play in the water, go surfing and stuff because I pretend I'm collecting seaweed, but I go surfing. And, um, and, and taking it longitudinally where we maybe will get to the point where we're saving some of the, the coastal organisms from our human pollution and things like that. Um, finally, a shameless plug. Um, over the last two years, I've worked to develop a new graduate program between USC and CHLA, Children's Hospital LA. And it's gonna be developmental origins of health and disease. And when you work those out, it's the DUDE program. Okay, so I know it's a little in there, um, paternalistic, but it's kind of fun getting a bunch of the suits and ties at USC to walk around saying, yeah, that dude program's pretty cool. But it's, it's a combination of what we've just been talking about. It's how environment affects lifelong health and disease and how a mother, when they're pregnant, you know, the, the food that's going into the body, the environment that she's around, how um, it's not just all on the women, it's, it's men too, how that can affect lifelong health of not only themselves, but their fetus and the germ cells that are in the fetus 
and across generations. And that all stems from studies uh, during World War II when the Nazis kind of starved the Dutch and there were a bunch of moms that were pregnant. And a lot of the um, fetuses that developed and the, the offspring from that are prone to lifelong obesity and secondary type two diabetes and cardiovascular diseases and stuff like that. So um, that's gonna come live in, in fall of 2023 and uh, Columbia students would be really awesome to reach out and get over there. There's actually one of the professors here has done a lot of the seminar, seminal studies, a guy named Lumi over in public health, I think, here at Columbia. Um, so that's, that's my story for now. Um, and these are my collaborators. I've tried to mention them along the way and our funding sources and the, the heart studies are an, a new R01. And then this, these um, Revive and Restore Foundation are trying to, and, and the San Diego Zoo are funding the conservation biology applications on that. Thanks. Thank you. That was that was awesome. That was great. I, I didn't know that I would learn about kelp today, but that is that really cool. Yeah. Um, so we have time for questions. I think part of the kelp is be careful how you eat it when you collect uh, it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll ask one slightly non-scientific question, which is, you know, knowing the the Type of environment that you were in as a postdoc and the type of work that you focused on and then building your research program from there. Um, what was the trajectory that led you from, you know, chick embryology to doing such a broad spectrum of things uh, all the way to conservation biology and like how, how do you actually structure the growth of a program like that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, when I was a grad student here, I worked on mouse genetics. We were making immunodeficiencies. So I was in a guy named Dr. Fred Alt's lab. And it was a really good environment. And I think that's where I realized how expensive science was and, and that we wanted to work in embryos and we couldn't do it without some of the newer technology. And so I developed a real expensive quail along the way. And that, that probably wasn't really well thought through. But I, I it was just trying to find novel untreaded area. I kind of like not doing additive science. It was, where can we make a breakthrough? And I think that was the guiding um, principles on that. The, the drawback on that is it can be sometimes you can go through periods where funding is tricky. And, and that's a real concern and, and a stress. And um, somehow we always get funding when we're about out of funding. So we've been lucky. But um, yeah, it's, it's try to be novel, but try and also stay fun. <laughs> so, yep. So, this is a basic question, but it has to do with the uh, health mm -hmm. Maybe not. Um, my terminology might be wrong. But uh, when you showed that picture with Sergey and I saw it, it looked like you were creating creating them there. We're not creating anything. They're they're we've collected them first and foremost because we're not, and and the mutations we're not inducing. It's just they're already in the natural environment. So the six hundred GWASs and in independent genotypes are out there. So yeah, I'll be careful with that. We're not creating anything. We're identifying them and then screening them right now. And at, at some point, it might be, you know, we're, we've got um, my developmental bio class right now. One of their lab modules is how do we stain the, um, the algae? And they're trying to work on getting the nucleus because it's tricky. Animals don't have this thing called a cell wall. The cell wall is really different, all the different algaes, and it's, it's really tough to get past. It's, it's had time to develop really well and be resistant. Um, and we're trying to work out, so we're trying to make protoplast things that will do it gently and then recover. And we're working up ways to transfect plasmids in there. So that'll get a little bit more hands-on. And we've got some good preliminary data on for one, a green algae called Ulva. And, but the promoters, brown algae is evolutionarily way away. So odds are the ones for Ulva and the ones for human aren't gonna work in that. 
So we'll have to figure that out through the genome. Other questions? Yes. We we haven't gone species yet. Um, we're gonna play with another one called ectocarpus. For me, and, and your terminology is fine. I don't know much about algae. I kind of just jumped into this because I like Sergey and we taught Deb Bio together for years and it seemed like fun. And and it has been. So we're again, we, we haven't induced any mutations. We're just trying to screen and see what's out there initially. And we're right now in Macrocystis peripheral, which is giant sea kelp, it's fastest growing organism on earth. Um, and then we're gonna get a little bit more hands-on, but we don't know enough to know what we would do at this point. So we're, we're pretty observational and trying to screen through lots of natural samples is, is a fair way of saying it. Yeah, there's lots of quail is a model system, and just like mouse and C. elegans. And, you know, there's pluses of quail as model system and drawbacks. And I think every single model system is that way. You know, zebrafish is really clear. So you can see into it, not much opacity. And it's wonderful for imaging and it's high throughput enough for um, Weishaus and Bullhart um, developed high throughput screening protocols for it. So we've got lots of mutants. Um, quail uncoupled from mom, it's not great for high throughput, but it is good for observational and there's a lot of molecular bio that go into it. So I think anytime when we're setting up a model system to study fetal alcohol syndrome, we're spending a lot of time trying to say, is this relevant to human? Because there's not a lot of quail moms that are cruising around quail hens drinking alcohol, but there's a decent number of human ones. So we're trying to put that in the NIH doesn't care about quail alcoholics, but they do care about um, the other. So yeah, we're always trying to map it up there. And that's any model system though. Okay, maybe we can take one question from uh, the Zoom. Can you riff a bit on fertilization in amniotes, one by one species, versus in ocean, n by n species? <laughs> I don't think so. I like the riff. Um, <laughs> fertilization in amniotes, so one on one versus kind of a pan. Is that how that question is going? In the ocean, it, the fertilization is broader. Is that how you're interpreting that? Because the sperm is going out and the environment's less confined. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't have any personal research on that. I know I talked taught fertilization a week ago in DevBio. Environments are different. It, it would be a real general. I'm sorry, this is probably a, a flaky answer, but you know, there, there's a way that the oocyte attracts sperm to it. And in the ocean, you're getting diluted out quite a bit really quickly. So it's got to have a powerful way for sperm to kind of get there. There's a lot of sperm selection in quail and in humans along the way. But I don't know if I have a great answer for that in general. I think that qualifies as a riff. <laughs> okay. There's, yeah, there's a riff. Okay. I'll take that. Okay. Um, yeah, if there's, if there's no more questions, let's once again thank uh, Professor Lansford.